Uh, welcome everyone to BIG's uh, IIE's sharing session. We do this once a month where we invite usually an SMU alumni entrepreneur to come back and share about his or her experiences through the entrepreneurial journey. So today we have with us Risha, an uh, SMU alumni. Um, he is the co-founder of YQ. So show of hands, how many people have used YQ, have heard of YQ, know what they do? You know, if you don't turn your video, I can't see, but okay. So far, about 50% great. Um, I've not heard of YQ before in my life until I saw him on the news. Uh, and then it turns out that I actually have used your services before because interestingly, we're going to talk about this later. Um, they power the hawker delivery in Food Panda. So if you buy hawker food on Food Panda, you have used YQ before. So let's hand the stage over to Risha to talk a little more about and what why he does, like a short introduction and a little background of himself before we move on to talk a bit more about his journey and how they got from zero to 200,000 users in the last couple of years. Off to you. Okay, thank you, Denise. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Asumi, for the opportunity to do this. Uh, okay, I'll just start talking about uh, YQ. So YQ essentially is uh, Singapore's largest hawker food delivery service. So we have about 2,500 Hawker partners and we do about 3,000 deliveries on a daily basis. Uh, we are island-wide uh, and we cover over 50 Hawker centers. Uh, what we're able to do is deliver Hawker food uh, with no minimum order and very low delivery charges because of how our batching model is structured. So we essentially convert these Hawker centers into hubs and uh, because of that, we're able to stack orders and create optimized delivery routes uh, using our algos. And this ensures that we actually have the lowest cost per delivery in the entire food delivery industry. Uh, so what sets us apart for hawkers is that we understand them and we've customized our tech, our business model and our processes to cater for their needs. So for example, uh, two hawkers, we charge 0% in commissions. Uh, with no onboarding fees, and we're also able to facilitate same-day payments to hawkers. Uh, so we're also able to set up this YQ technology on the hawker's personal device itself, uh, so that they, they don't need to have these large tech devices placed at their already uh, small stalls. Yep. Well, that's, that's great. That's uh, really interesting. So how, perhaps you can share a bit more about how you first came up with this idea and uh, why you decided to get into this space. So before that, you work for JP Morgan, if I'm not wrong, right? Maybe you can yeah, share so a bit more just, about your story. Yeah. Sure, I'll just talk a little bit about myself. So I'm originally from Calcutta in, in India. I moved to Singapore in 2008 to join SMU, uh, where I studied information systems and finance. Uh, it's always something I want to do is be an entrepreneur. Uh, so at SMU, I took courses that helped me sort of achieve uh, that goal. Uh, even though I wasn't the best in terms of grades, I did uh, technical courses and worked at startups uh, during my summer breaks. And these skills uh, helped me understand my business better and work with uh, my tech team, even though I'm not uh, actually a coder. Uh, so most importantly in SMU, I also met Varun, who turned out to be my co-founder at YQ. So that was a, a good thing that happened at SMU. And two courses that I highly recommend to uh, people in SMU were computer as an analysis tool uh, that's called CAT, which is very useful in terms of learning how to use Excel and analyze data, and also database management and information systems, uh, which helped me understand tech better. So I was then, I graduated uh, from SMU in 2012, and uh, I was actually the first person in my family to hold a corporate job. Uh, I joined JP Morgan, where I worked for four years uh, as part of their analyst program. And that's where I saw this uh, opportunity in the Hawker, Hawker food space. Uh, so just to elaborate more on that, um, while I was working as a junior banker, I was sent many times to Hawker centers to tap out food for the entire team, uh, which, is, which is basically the culture. And that's where I realized how big uh, Hawker food was in Singapore and how much people loved it. Uh, so when I walked over to the Hawker center, I saw how crowded hockey centers were. You had to fight for seats. You had to queue up at stalls. Uh, it was overwhelming for me because uh, I was completely new to this concept of hockey centers. 
Uh, and then I thought, okay, so on the one hand, you have these really overcrowded hawker centers uh, and people around me just love eating that hawker food, which is delicious and affordable. And on the other hand, when I did my research, I saw a gap in the market because I saw that other food delivery players were only focused on these mid to high tier restaurants and no one was sort of serving this niche of hawker food, primarily due to the lo low cost of hawker food uh, resulting in a low basket size. And that's when I thought that this is something worth pursuing. So at that point in time, what did you start doing um, when you realized, hey, there's an opportunity? How did you start validating that opportunity or how did you do your customer research? Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, just share them on the Zoom chat and then we'll either ask them throughout the discussion or we'll do it at the Q&A at the end. Uh, yeah, so going back, so when you realize, hey, nobody's focused on these, um, I guess, lower margin uh, businesses, what did you start doing? Um, so in terms of understanding the customer, I think one of the things that we did well was understand our hawker partners first before we actually uh, built our product. So while I was at JP Morgan, sorry, while I was at JP Morgan, I approached um, over 50 hawker stalls to learn more about their pain points and their needs. So even though I couldn't speak the local language, I was able to overcome that communication barrier. And I found 10 hawkers uh, who then went on to become my pilot hawkers. So I think here I want to stress on the importance of uh, talking to your customers and learning their needs before actually building your product. Um, so one of the hawkers I spoke to was uh, Mr. Chan at uh, Spinach Soup, uh, at a Moy Street food center who owns a stall called Spinach Soup. Uh, he told me that himself and a lot of other hawkers were basically coming in as early as 4 a.m and doing about uh, 20 hours uh, of work in a day. Uh, having spoken to him more in detail, I realized that some of his major uh, pain points were things like um, they were paying high prices for their raw materials. Uh, they couldn't afford commissions uh, on their food because of their razor thin margins. Uh, they needed payments to be made on the same day uh, because they had to in turn pay their uh, raw material suppliers the very next day and they couldn't afford their own delivery stuff. So they couldn't do their own deliveries and that and thereby increase their revenue. So these are some of the pain points that uh, we were able to essentially discover by speaking to our first set of pilot talkers. Um, next, what we did was basically thought about how we can actually tackle those uh, pain points. So do you want me to Talk about yeah, that that'd next. be great. So how did you translate the pain points to actually your USP or your solution? Yeah, uh, so I think what we developed with YQ was essentially uh, a way to tackle these uh, pain points uh, by, force, by enabling the customer to pay for those uh, commissions. So instead of putting that charge on the hawker, what we did was the customer paid a small markup on the hawker food as well as a dollar fifty in terms of in terms of delivery fees. So even after the customer did that, uh, even after the markup and the delivery fee, it was still cheaper for the customer to order with YQ as compared to ordering from another delivery service that was selling the mid to high tier restaurant food. So um, so that's great, right? You found a solution to hawkers not being able to pay commissions, and you're like, okay, let me yep. find. A different way of charging them and that probably enabled you to onboard a lot of hawkers because to them there's no cost. Exactly so that resulted in us uh, getting about we're up to now 2,500 hawker stall partners. Uh, we were also sort of able to enable same day payments to hawkers so we built our tech in a way that we can actually facilitate payments before the end of the day for all the orders that we do for them on that day. Uh, that helped a lot of hawkers basically uh, come on board to YQ as well. And then to tackle that cost, uh, that rising cost of the raw material supplies, what we're doing is working on this wholesale supplier marketplace. Uh, so this marketplace essentially enables hawkers to use the YQ hawker app, which they already have installed, uh, to, to go out there and actually buy their suppliers from that app. Uh, and we're able to bring on board suppliers 
um, that are charging lesser than what the hawkers are paying right now because YQ is sort of consolidating this at the hawker center level uh, instead of the supplier going directly to the hawker, YQ is a middleman who consolidates orders from a lot of hawkers and represents the hawker center in that sense. So we're able to bring down the cost of their raw materials as well. So those 10 uh, pilot hawkers that I initially spoke about, uh, they still, we still have a very close personal relationship with them. Uh, they became our ambassadors. Uh, they help put the word out there uh, to other hawkers and also to their own customers uh, about YQ. So we have a question from Keisha that I think is really, really relevant, right? So how did you convince these people at the hawker centers to speak with you? Um, did you provide some sort of in incentive and invite them to share and talk about it? Or did they just do it purely because, you know, it's something that they also wanted for themselves? Uh, so they had been looking to work with delivery players. That is something they were very open about. Uh, but they didn't have the capabilities of uh, basically giving them that 30 to 40% commission uh, that, you know, most food delivery uh, services charge. Uh, and also they couldn't wait for that two week or three week payment cycle uh, when it comes to that's the time it takes for these food delivery services to actually give uh, these uh, vendors money for the food that they buy from them. So that was something that was a big no-no for them. Uh, when we came in and having understood that these were the pain points, told them that our focus is only on hawkers. We are not a food delivery service that looks at anything above uh, uh, hawker food, that, that low cost food segment, and that we're building systems where we can facilitate those same day payments uh, and that and that this would basically be an extension of the revenue that they're earning right now as compared to us eating into their existing profits that they had worked so hard to uh, to get uh, so get, saying saying all that getting that word out there uh, that in no way is YQ taking any money from you as a hawker uh, to to be on board YQ that's how we uh, got our first uh, hawkers on board. So you basically created a win-win-win situation all around through the ecosystem and you didn't need to, yeah. you know, pay incentives or anything to get them on board. That yeah. I, guess, I guess that sounds like you were really solving one of the problems, right? Or you're really bringing value to the customers. So that's really great. Um, how about, you know, after you have talked to these 10 pilot class clients and built the app, um, when it's time to launch, right? So how did you go from 10 to, let's say, 100? or so on and so right. forth. What happened uh, in your go-to launch? Perhaps you can share a bit more on the initial stages of um, getting initial clients. Right, so first we, uh, the first thing we did having got all this information was create a, this prototype. So we basically outsourced development to this tech team. Uh, some of the key things that we uh, got in place was to make sure that we can deliver the food affordably with low delivery charges to the customer, with uh, no minimum order fees to customers. And in general, our mission was to sort of reduce the overall delivery charge of food in Singapore. Uh, and at the same time, ensure that hawkers aren't sort of uh, charged these uh, commissions. So what we did well, I think, was we took advantage of these grants that the Singapore government has to offer, uh, where we got a grant of about 10K to work with an outsourced uh, uh, developer to come up with this uh, prototype. And then we did this, uh, did this beta launch using that prototype. Um, how we did that effectively is a very interesting story about how Varun and I literally stood on uh, escalators leading up to the same office buildings where we were doing our jobs, handing out flyers about BiQ. And all our colleagues, ex-colleagues are like, uh, what happened to you guys? Did you get fired? <laughs> uh, why are you standing here disputing flyers? So we thought that as uh, basically this is our own business. So use as many personal relationships as you can uh, to get the word out there. Uh, literally went from distributing flyers ourselves to, to calling ex-colleagues and forcing them to place orders uh, with YQ at least for the first time. Uh, on the hawker side, we used these 10 pilot hawkers to do some uh, publicity around YQ by asking them to give out flyers to their regular walk-in customers, uh, which, which had uh, basically some sort of a, a promo code for them to go out there and uh, place their first order. 
And all this, along with that, we also set up these uh, YQ stickers uh, at a lot of the stalls that we were working with by then. Uh, all this buzz basically led to us being picked up by uh, Today newspaper, which is, I think, Singapore's largest uh, uh, free newspaper. And uh, because of this unique story about uh, centered around the love for hawker food in Singapore. Cool. So you first started really initially when you your go to market was basically hustling your network, yep. um, trying to get some publicity, uh, guerrilla marketing, and organic growth, basically, right? Yep. Um, yep. Well, that's that's a lot of work. Um, did you feel, I guess, embarrassed in any sense? Was it hard, you know, to go out and hustle after? you know, in the same building where you used to work in nice suits? Like, how, how did that feel? Like, how, what made you, um, I guess, be okay with going and putting yourself out there and really trying to get your, your startup, um, to get orders for YQ? Uh, I, it was a bit uh, challenging, definitely, to begin with, especially when you know that uh, uh, the, these are the same places where you were initially doing that corporate job, but the whole point of it is that I do not sort of uh, regret working uh, with JP Morgan for those four years because it taught me a lot in terms of discipline uh, and also, you know, doing that job on a day-to-day -day basis. That's something that came only when I did my corporate job. Um, so I I was also able to build that network. So while while working at JPM, I was able to talk to these hawkers uh, in the CBD, the central business district area, get my pilot set of hawkers, uh, build a network of potential customers through my acquaintances and uh, uh, through friends of friends, et cetera, who are working in the industry. Uh, so yeah, though I would, I definitely hold that to be uh, very valuable, that time spent at JP Morgan as well. Tell me a bit more about, so uh, what happened after? So you raised a couple of rounds of money through your entire couple of years uh, at yep. YQ. So yep. after you started launching your product, you, you said you raised a, an angel round to some friends and network. Yeah, um, let, me, let me share about that. So yeah. uh, when we first started off, we focused on this niche target segment of the CBD area. Uh, although we wanted to be um, an island-wide delivery service, we started with CBD and we focused on that we also went down personally to sort of meet the uh, customers who were ordering with YQ and understand the delivery processes better. Uh, just before our launch to the public in Feb 2017, uh, we raised money from a few angels that we met at uh, Bansi. So that's basically the business angel network of Southeast Asia. Uh, at that point, we convinced them not so much on the numbers, uh, but more on the team and the vision and the proof of concept that we had. So at that time we were doing about, uh, we had about 300 customers whom we had gotten through just literally cold calling or, or calling our friends and acquaintances and handing out flyers ourselves. And we had just about uh, less than not even 50 hawkers on our platform. Uh, so that's when we raised um, our first round of funding. So with that money, uh, we were able to ramp up uh, marketing a little bit more. Uh, so we got in place um, a, a freelancer who worked as a designer. We got these bright yellow t-shirts uh, that really stood out in the CBD uh, because uh, there was no other company that had that logo and that color scheme uh, that worked well for us. We tested a few things to see what would work. So we did a bit of social media marketing with the funds that we raised. We did some offline marketing. Um, we yeah. <clears throat> We had these uh, chope tissues. So choping is, a, is big in Singapore where you basically re reserve a seat at a hawker center using tissues. So we had these tissues that we printed called uh, Never Chope Again. So it basically mm. spoke about how instead of choping at these hawker centers, why don't you sort of order with uh, uh, order online with YQ and, and prevent this hassle of going down to the hawker center. So at that time, we saw uh, that the 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 vendor that we had outsourced our technology to uh, was moving a bit too slowly for us um, because they were involved in other projects as well, not just YQ. So what we did with that vendor then was uh, we poached the entire team that was working on YQ. Uh, so their, their head of tech and the few guys who were working closely with them, uh, we got on board to be 
our CTO, our head of Android, iOS, etc. So I, I think at this point, it's key to highlight how important it is to have your own uh, tech team when you're doing a tech heavy uh, a startup like this, because the speed of growth then uh, increased significantly having our own uh, tech team in place. After that, from uh, 2017 to 2019, we basically raised a total of uh, four rounds. So the first one was the angel round that I spoke about. The second one was another angel round where the same angels reinvested. Uh, the third one was basically a pre-series A round where we raised money from two family offices. And the fourth round, which we closed at the end of uh, 2019, was our series A from Delivery Hero. So Delivery Hero is this... Um, a uh, German-based company that's publicly listed and uh, uh, one of the biggest, I think probably the biggest food delivery company. Uh, so at the time of us raising our Series A, we were doing about 1,500 orders per day and we had about 1,500 Holka partners at that time. So cool. So like it kind of seemed, seems like, you know, your growth from zero to 200,000 really has, you know, a couple of phases, right? So you first started with, you know, um, building a pre-launch list, like you have your own pilot users to test out the stuff. And then when you first started um, launching it, you basically hustled and got your own network to do it. After that, yep. when you raised your first fund, it seems like you did some paid customer acquisition and contact marketing, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I think during our conversation before, you also mentioned the third kind of phase that you had after you raised a, a, a next round as well as going into partnerships and strategic yep. partnerships. So. And I think that really helped you, you know, scale quite a lot. So why not we start talking a little more about the different partnerships that you had uh, during yep. your YQ journey and how it has helped you get to 200,000 um, users. Yeah, you're right. So in terms of how we went from that zero to 200K, the first one definitely was a lot of organic growth that came from hustling. Uh, so I think we've covered that. For the second one, there was a lot of, uh, at that point, we raised money and we were able to do a couple of campaigns like new user promo codes, uh, referral programs, uh, stuff like that. We also did some content marketing where we uh, set up this series called Hawkers of Singapore. Uh, so this is basically based out of the Humans of New York series, uh, where we went down to our different Hawker partners and understood what they were doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, like how their lives were. Uh, operating, managing, and running, and owning these uh, these hawker stalls. So that was a big hit with our customer base because it gave them a nice insight into the lives of their uh, hawker heroes. And that resulted in us also getting picked up by a lot of media houses as well. So those were, that second phase was crucial in our development as well, um, which we were able to do more of because by then we had raised some funds. The third phase is the one that really uh, helped us uh, with significant growth, which is our strategic partnerships. So our key learning was that essentially home, homegrown brands um, uh, really helped us to kickstart the growth. So the first brand that really helped us was DBS. So DBS is Singapore's uh, largest bank, but they're very much in tune with the local, uh, local scene and the local F&B scene in Singapore as well. Uh, what DBS did was helped us a lot with marketing, sending out emails to their customer base, uh, setting up YQ stickers all over uh, DBS offices, and also giving us a very low uh, MDR, which is a transaction fee uh, amount for every transaction uh, that we did. Uh, what we did in return was uh, create this entire ecosystem with uh, DBS payments, which is from customers to hawkers, and now even from hawkers to suppliers. Uh, is something that we set up with DBS's help through these uh, low transaction fees and these same day payments. A question for that specifically. Yep. Um, so you facilitate the money going from the customer to the hawker um, or does the money go to you and you just take a percentage of it? How does the business model work? Uh, it's two transactions that are happening essentially. The customer pays on YQ and then YQ releases the payments to the hawkers. And then you just get, do you get a percentage or you don't? Through the uh, no, we don't. We don't okay. cut. We don't take any commission from the hawkers. Okay, cool. So, yep. uh, DBS, and then I think you mentioned a couple more partnerships that were quite yep, integral yep. to your growth. Yeah, absolutely. So on DBS, uh, one more thing I want to add is the importance of 
uh, how we basically got very lucky with the DBS partnership, where it was just a case of uh, someone at DBS seeing a YQ flyer, uh, placing an order with YQ, and being happy with the offerings and the service, and that sort of led into uh, led to this uh, long-term relationship with DBS. So that offline marketing in the early days uh, helped us, uh, especially with DBS as well. Uh, we also work closely with Singtel, who owns uh, Hungry Goware. So we set up this uh, uh, order with YQ button at different pages that Hungry Goware has uh, for hawkers, so as to sort of close the loop where, because you can't really reserve a table uh, at a hawker center, what you can do as a customer is close the loop and place an order with YQ for that hawker stall. We're doing similar partnerships now with Burpal and TripAdvisor for that. Another key partnership was Changi Airport Group. So they have this, uh, they have these restricted zones uh, where you can't deliver unless you have special permission from Changi. And we got that with the help of uh, Changi Airport uh, Group where YQ was the only delivery service who was able to deliver in those zones. The next homegrown partner that really helped us was NTUC Enterprise. Uh, so NTUC owns Kopi Tiam. They bought over Kopi Tiam recently and own over 100 food courts here. Uh, so now what we're doing is working to get them on board to YQ as well uh, to, to grow our uh, overall numbers. And we're also working with NTUC because they have a large network of suppliers uh, on our wholesale supplier marketplace project. Uh, so now having leveraged these homegrown brands, what we did was we looked into partnering with other delivery services um, to grow that awareness of Hawker Food. Uh, so first, what we did was we partnered with Deliveroo. Uh, we did a two-month pilot with Deliveroo where we were managing their entire uh, hawker food business. Uh, we did that for about two months, and then we were approached uh, by Food Panda to do something similar for them. Uh, so we decided, okay, let's give Food Panda a shot, and we listed about 10 to 15 uh, hawker centers, which is about 150 hawker stalls. Uh, on Food Panda, and that response was uh, amazing. I think because Food Panda has a great presence, especially in the Heartlands area, uh, we saw a great demand for that uh, hawker food on Food Panda. So we linked our tech in a way that all the orders were routed through via the YQ backend and sent to the YQ Hawker app, even if we, even if it's placed on the Food Panda customer app. Um, so what we saw was instead of this eating into YQ's numbers, we saw a reverse effect where people were actually getting more familiar with the fact that Hawker Food is affordable and uh, can now be delivered affordably as well. Uh, so instead of it eating into YQ's orders, we saw a great uh, significant growth after Food Panda partnership on a lot of customers looking at the fact that Hawker Food can now be delivered by Food Panda and then logging into YQ to see that same Hawker Food available at an even cheaper price uh, on YQ. Uh, so so how, that did, how did these customers know about YQ though? Like, so when I order on Food Panda, I don't mm -hmm. know that it's powered by YQ. So yeah. So essentially when you learn that Hawker Food can be delivered, if you do a simple uh, Google search or if you look at Hawker Food delivery options, in Singapore, the first one of the first few results you'll see is YQ. And now if you go down to a lot of the hawker centers, a uh, majority of them will have that YQ sticker talking about how we do our delivery as well. So it's um, a mix of, you know, having good marketing and um, yeah. a presence online as well as physical um, brand awareness, I suppose, that helped. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that, that partnership then uh, led into in turn to our investment from Delivery Hero uh, for our Series A because uh, Delivery Hero owns Food Panda and uh, yep, that's where we are today. Yeah, it sounds like a great story with a nice ending. You know, you, you start partnering with these people and eventually you get one of the, the owners to invest in, into you guys. Um, perhaps we can talk a bit more about this uh, partnership with Food Panda and the investment into Delivery Hero. Um, essentially, you know, when you get money from them, it means that you would just work exclusively with Food Panda instead of being able to work with, you know, Grab or um, other del Deliveroo and other delivery companies. So how did you decide at that point in time, which is better to limit yourself and be exclusive uh, or, you know, to be polyamorous, I suppose, if you can call that. 
yeah so the nature of the industry is that you can't really work with more than one uh big delivery player in that sense um so when we worked with deliveroo we saw that the numbers that we were getting there were not as high as we sort of expected i think uh, the way that it was positioned or the number of users or app downloads that deliveroo has isn't as much as a food panda when we partnered with food panda so because of that we basically paused our deliveroo partnership and uh, we we tried food panda so on food panda we saw that from day one there was a much bigger demand for this food uh, just in terms of the number of people who have the app downloaded plus the demographic of the people a lot of people in the heartlands so delivery is probably more popular in the cbd areas uh, but by then we were doing a lot of orders uh, from zones like sankang haugang which are uh, very heavy residential areas with very very popular hawker centers uh, and we saw that the numbers there just exploded when we put those uh, hawker stalls on food panda Uh, so that convinced us that uh, if we have to choose uh, between the two we we will go with food panda we did try to work with both uh, try to sell the fact that we can do manage aggregation of orders for both but that was something that was not acceptable okay um oh that's could you talk a bit more about when you first decided to say hey let's try to work with other food delivery companies because some people would think that it's it's a competition right i mean if you talk about food delivery the the, the main competitors you think of are uh, food panda you know delivery grab food and things like that so how do you come up with the idea of saying hey maybe they're not competitors maybe they could be partners and how do you decide at that point in time if it's a good idea to partner them or it would just if it would just cannibalize um your clients or did you just say hey let's go and try it and just see where it goes so how how was this decision making process right uh, so we've been monitoring the progress of these bigger players when it comes to this hawker food space uh food panda has tried doing hawker food uh they've been here since 2012 so they've tried a few times um at uh, at this hawker food segment but they hadn't been very successful um so we've learned from from why they failed some of the reasons uh are similar to what i mentioned because they have this long payment cycle they they have these large devices that you need to keep uh, at a hawker stall a lot of it is very tech heavy so hawkers are still uh, not all hawkers are okay with uh, using so much technology if they're using their own personal device it's one thing but having these a uh, bigger tech system set up on their side is not something that they're comfortable with um so we realize that these guys they don't really have the tech infrastructure and the processes in place uh, to convert their very successful uh, mid to high tier restaurant model into a hawker food model uh, which is very different from uh, a hawker food partner operates very differently from how a restaurant part, uh, operates Uh, so we were confident that we had a strong enough moat uh, that we had these 2500 hawker stalls uh, now uh, whom we had very good relations with uh, they were already on the yq hawker app uh, we're rolling out these new services to them where they can order their supplies uh, we we've, we've done a pilot with the pos integration as well so we we, we feel confident that these hawkers are long term customers of yq and we wanted to further increase um their revenue uh, mm-hmm. their dependency or reliance as well on yq um so the best way we thought of doing that was uh keeping these relationships with us while at the same time exposing them to food pandas let's say 2 million customer base was if we work with this delivery player and uh aggregate orders for them by using our technology that we've already set up at the hawker stalls so there's no extra work for hawkers uh, to a hawker it goes similar to a yq mm-hmm. order uh, but to a customer you now have uh, basically suddenly a 10 times larger customer base to to look at so it sounds like an ecosystem play so basically your main clients are the hawkers and you just really went to to understand how you can help them increase revenue and sales and you just probably just you know thought of different ideas and i guess partnering with foodpanda is one of the ways you can basically help them uh, earn more money 
Um, yeah, exactly. We do we do position ourselves as this hawker first digital ecosystem. So we start off as a food delivery service, but now we we provide a lot of services to our hawker partners as well. So our core strength of the company is definitely those hawker partners. Cool. So um, we have a few questions right now over here. Um, I think uh, Liang Ling, oh, he's just coming back a bit. So he's really interested in hearing more about your tech or uh, your logistics. So how do you actually um, bunch orders together, for example? Um, yeah, perhaps you want to share a bit more about that. So we that. do, uh, sure, we do uh, batching on two sides. So we do batching on the first uh, side when we send orders to hawkers. So for each hawker, we know their uh, order preparation time and we derive this meal freshness indicator based on that preparation time. So let's say as a customer, even if you order at 11 a.m., it doesn't mean that we would send the order to the hawker at 11. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even if your delivery time is, let's say, 12 p.m., we then figure out the best time to send uh, that order to every different hawker partner and based on the amount of time that they need to cook. So a chicken rice stall would essentially be a lot faster than, let's say, a fish soup stall. Uh, so we would send that uh, or rather a barbecued stall, for example, which would take longer. So for a chicken rice stall, we'd send that same order at, let's say, 11.35 or 11.40. Uh, so as to, so we do some batching on that side when it comes to sending orders to hawkers. So on the other side, what we also have is batching when it comes to creating delivery routes for our couriers. So we deliver in fixed zones. Uh, we, we break down Singapore into about 10 different zones. So you can't order across zones, uh, but within that same zone, we make sure there's at least uh, a handful, five to seven hawker centers uh, uh, that, that you can choose from. And then we do stacking of orders uh, for creating those uh, optimized delivery routes for our couriers. So once the uh, or once all the orders are ready, we have this hawker captain. So essentially at every hawker center, we have one person who acts as a hawker captain who is able to collect food from the different hawker stalls and bring it to this distribution point, which we call as a hub. So at this hub is where your delivery biker would meet the YQ hawker captain and then go for their delivery. So when, when a biker does a delivery for YQ, they're essentially delivering about 10 to 12 meals uh, at three to four different locations. So it's basically one pickup at a hawker center and then drop, 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 something like that. Uh, so that's where we do a lot of uh, stacking as well. Cool. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, I guess that's how I can get my hawker food on Food Panda in 40 minutes. Uh, all right. Yep, yep. So um, we have another question from Kishaf. Uh, do you plan to ex restrict yourself to hawker centers or do you plan on onboarding other restaurants as well? Uh, so that's a great question. So in Singapore, there's about 6,500 uh, hawker stalls. So these are the NEA operated hawker stalls that basically are, are, are managed by the government. Uh, but in, in overall, if you include your private uh, food courts, for example, what NTUC owns, those 100 plus food courts, uh, that were previously owned by Kopitiam and other privately owned food courts, along with these small uh, coffee shops and small F and B vendors, which is a which is basically our target market. Uh, uh, that totals up to about seventeen thousand vendors. So our total, in that sense, is that seventeen k number that we're aiming to reach. Of that seventeen k, we're currently at uh, two and a half thousand, uh, primarily hawker stalls but now we're expanding into uh, the food courts as well. Um, is there any competition, like people who also work with hawkers or are you basically the only player really in Singapore? Uh, so in terms of direct competition, there have been a lot of companies that have come into the hawker space uh, to, to try hawker food deliveries. Um, but so far there's no competitor who has uh, gotten as big of a vendor base or into a customer base or even in terms of uh, daily deliveries as us. So I, there's some learning that we've had from these yeah. companies uh, who haven't done well. I think I won't name the companies, but there was one company who was basically uh, using vending machines to uh, store their hawker food. Uh, that was a problem in a few ways because 
firstly if you grow to the extent where you you suddenly have in serve 20 customers you have 40 customers you essentially need another vending machine uh, which is a big cost uh, you need permission to set up those vending machines at different places um, and a customer's experience in taking out food from a vending machine is not uh, uh, you know not a pleasant one so that was one company who tried uh, that process but it didn't work out even though i understand why they tried using vending machines because that sort of helped them to batch orders together uh, but it just didn't, didn't work in terms of the end result for the customer there was another company that did distance based delivery fees uh, so you could order from anywhere but your delivery fee would depend on uh, how far away you were from the hawker center that resulted in uh, people ordering a chicken rice worth let's say $5 uh, and paying a delivery fee of 5 to $7 on top of that so that doesn't sit well in the mind of a customer where you're paying twice the amount uh, that you would pay if you were to go down physically and eat at that store so that those high delivery fees and that was done because they were using an on demand model uh, where you could order from anywhere and you would get the food literally sort of on demand with no batching so there are two different types of models uh that have come in uh to tie this uh, hawker food segment out but both have had some flaws and we've we've been able to learn luckily from them as well so um i guess last two questions from me from me before we go into q and a so the first is you know so as you mentioned a lot of people have tried to go into this space what makes yq different and allowed you to have more staying power than the rest and the second question would be what are the challenges you see uh why you facing going forwards as you continue to try to scale and raise your series b uh what makes yq different is definitely the fact that when as a customer you order with yq you have to select that delivery time range or that uh, uh those time slots which help us to do that batching and in turn reduce our cost per delivery so hawker food uh itself is low cost so we figured out a way to ensure that it remains low cost even though we are getting it delivered um so that is something uh that has uh so initially it's a slight change in the customer mindset where you just want to order when you're hungry uh but what we've seen is that because we have these low prices and these low delivery rates people are okay to uh place their orders a little bit in advance to enjoy those uh lower rates uh so from a customer's perspective uh that has helped us uh, what we're also rolling out is things like uh loyalty programs subscription plans i think those will help uh in terms of customer stickiness as well where on a weekend you can just sit down and Uh, plan your meals for the next couple of weeks instead of having to uh, remember on a day-to-day -day basis that I have to order before this uh, order cut-off time. Uh, so those things uh, are, are things that we're building out that will continue to to help uh, customer stickiness. On the hawker side, what's helped us definitely is those is uh, meeting those uh, key pain points and and figuring them out, not charging them commissions, not setting up a lot of tech on their side. not delaying their payments uh, figuring out a way to connect them to suppliers uh, that can reduce their raw material costs as well uh, so so yeah we definitely feel like uh, these are the things that we've done uh, differently and this is a strong moat that yq has created for for, for ourselves in this uh, niche segment um, so it is what was your second question challenges going forward so what do you envision to be a challenge as you continue to scale uh some of the challenges are so for example we do see uh we do want to move uh this outside singapore as well so overseas expansion is high on our agenda for especially next year uh so this year we are continuing to uh especially because of covid so covid accelerated our growth in singapore in terms of app downloads in terms of residential deliveries even the office deliveries went down uh, but at one point we uh, were the number one food app in iOS and Android in Singapore so that gave us a lot of good uh, app downloads uh, so taking this model and seeing how we've we've taken a long time to 
make this model work to to develop processes and technology to help support this model now what we need to do is take this model outside singapore and uh, and replicate it in our first two uh, overseas cities that we are looking at right now are hong kong and kl kuala lumpur so replicating this model uh, and take and making sure that we can continue to uh, provide these low charges to customers while at the same time not charge these vendors any commissions is is basically the biggest challenge that uh, we have on our side but in order to help with that uh, what we did recently was we semi acquired this company called plum food uh, that that was based out of hong kong so we have their customer base and their vendor base uh from hong kong so when we do move to hong kong we have that uh that those numbers to basically kick start uh, our growth and on and, and our operations there at this point in time are you guys profitable or do you with the low delivery fees are you able to i guess cover the cost so that's a very challenging question in the food <laughs> delivery industry yeah. uh no we are not profitable but we are operationally profitable so at least that's a start uh mm-hmm. in terms of um, we do cover our uh, delivery costs uh, through our unique uh, unit economics but in terms of our overall costs and including our fixed costs our uh, our full time employee costs our tech costs we are not uh, overall profitable okay cool so i think that's kind of the end of the you know sharing segment we're going to go into q&a right now but before we do so just in case any one of you drop out as you said you know they're not profitable yet so please go and download their app uh reshop has uh, kindly i uh, gave uh, a discount code for you guys today so we're going to share a bit more about how we can get free hawker food for the next two orders <laughs> oh yeah sure so we have a discount code for new users so please uh, order using that it's called first five so it's the 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 word first uh, followed by the number 5 so that basically gives you 5 dollars off your first two orders um besides that we also have a referral program um so if you place your first order and you complete your order then you can uh, give your uh, friend that code uh, and if they place a first order using that code they get you both get i think it's 3 dollars off each Yeah, so it's making me really hungry food. right now. It's <laughs> almost dinner time. I'm thinking of hawker food. So, this can cook. Please go and download the app. At the same time, um we are from SMU IIE and if you're interested in joining our incubation program, please check us out. Um Donna here my colleague will put a link to our incubation program. Applications are open for our next next batch of incubators. And yeah, we put a link there. So, let's move on to Q&A. Thank you so much for sharing your really interesting story. So we have a uh, Weixing here. It, maybe you would like to ask your question instead of me repeating it. Weixing. Okay. Okay, take all. Hello. Hello. Um yeah, I'm just want to know like how uh what are the job scopes of you and your co-founder? How has it perhaps changed throughout the since the start of the beginning of the business, yeah. Oh, I love that question. So we when we started, we were uh, doing everything from suddenly uh, reading these legal documents which we had no idea how to read uh, also doing looking at our accounts um, even having to do a little bit of the co- on the coding side so it was every we were everywhere doing everything and that's not something that is uh, is exactly sustainable so as the company grew we were lucky enough to raise some uh, funding and hire people to help us uh, on these aspects so now what we have essentially is um we we have a team that helps us in singapore on sales uh, so corporate catering is a big part of our business where we deliver two offices as a whole uh, in a b2b relationship so to find more clients like that uh, biz dev essentially for us means Uh, acquiring and onboarding uh, hawkers so our hawker expansion is led by a biz dev team uh, we have a tech team based out of india uh, including our cto so uh, and uh, we have also a head of ops and head of marketing here uh, which they look at basically the different functions so for us now it's more of uh, managing uh, these teams um, and a little less on the on the ground stuff that we were 
initially dealing with. So for, for everything now, how the company has evolved is where a lot of now my time and Varun's time is spent on essentially managing these teams and fundraising. So I think that's very important for, uh, for a startup, especially one that's not profitable like ourselves. Uh, even, even though you, even if you've just completed a round, you already start looking for your next, uh, potential investors. So a lot of our time now, uh, goes in, into that essentially. Um, so for you and Varun, did, did you have distinct roles at the beginning and now, or you pretty much have kind of the same skill sets? Um, so we did have a few distinctions, uh, but there was a lot of overlap as well. Um, for me, I was looking more into things like uh, tech and operations um, and Varun looked more at the financial side of things, the projections and numbers. And together what we did was we looked at uh, strategies and where to expand and when to expand and stuff like that. So it's uh, a little bit of uh, different roles, but essentially we were doing a lot of the stuff together as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, any other questions? We are open this up to the floor. So if you're shy, you can always type it into the group chat. If you're not shy, then you can unmute uh, and ask uh, Rishav a question here. So I have a question here. This is, this is Dhruv Jain from India. And I have a question for Rishav. Uh, Rishav, could you just, it's so great to hear your passion and your story. I just want to know what are your uh, plans in terms of future funding requirements and uh, how much are you looking to scale up and over what period of time? Right. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, what we're doing right now is we're actively raising our next round of funding. Uh, so we're now raising, so we completed our series A at the end of last year and now we're raising our series, uh, series B round. Uh, the amount we are looking for is in the range of uh, five to seven million sing dollars, which will essentially help us with expanding. Uh, a part of it will be used for expansion in Singapore uh, because we have these other verticals that we're trying out in terms of the supply deliveries and the POS integration. Uh, but majority of those funds, I would say 65 to 70% of those funds uh, would be used for overseas expansion to our first two pilot cities of Hong Kong and KL. Um, the important, more important than actually getting that money in is to find the right partner to get that money from. Uh, so Delivery Hero is already uh, an important backer for, for YQ, but at the same time, we we're looking to get a couple of uh, strategic partners who have a good presence and experience in these uh, overseas markets who can help us uh, expand there as well. So our round uh, would ideally be made up of uh, a few uh, investors, including uh, Delivery Hero and a couple of VCs or strategic partners who can help us uh, grow overseas. Wonderful. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. All right. Do we have any last um, burning questions? Since we still have Rishab here, all right. It seems like we do not. Everyone's really quiet and really shy. It's always so interesting to, uh, you know, do an interview on 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 a webinar online because you really cannot see their faces. They might all yeah. be sleeping for all you know. <laughs> it's my first time as well doing this on Zoom, but it's nice. Yeah, how did how do you feel uh, sharing it on Zoom? I feel great. I I wanted to just quickly share a little bit about how we've done this uh, gift a meal initiative. Sure, please uh, do. You so, have five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, like you ran this uh, initiative during COVID, uh, which basically helped uh, give a very simple and easy platform for Singaporeans to uh, sponsor meals to people affected by COVID. So we have our uh, migrant workers, which as you all know in Singapore uh, were deeply affected and our healthcare heroes. 
So through this uh, initiative, we were able to deliver uh, 15,000 meals uh, to a lot of these uh, general hospitals. And uh, so it was a win-win because not only did we deliver to the frontline workers and migrant workers, but also we took these meals from uh, our hawker stall partners who during COVID were because of the circuit breaker and because of the closing of dine-in uh, were facing difficulty. So all these 15,000 meals uh, were taken from our, our uh, were cooked by our hawker food partners. And uh, so we were basically overwhelmed by the response from Singaporeans to uh, to deliver, uh, to, to sponsor and donate these meals uh, to our healthcare workers. So it was about uh, a $4 per meal, essentially, uh, that, that, uh, that a Singaporean could donate. So 15,000 meals in effect wow. was about $60,000 worth of uh, donation. So uh, we received a lot of heartfelt messages from uh, the people working at hospitals, doctors, nurses, and also from hawkers uh, about how IQ sort of helped them support their uh, business during COVID, even pa as part of this initiative as well. So yeah, thank you for, for, for that as well. That's still open. So if you oh, want to- cool. well, you uh, want to shed a link on the chat? <laughs> sure, I'll do that. So if you, if you want to do a donation uh, or sponsor a meal for healthcare heroes or migrant worker heroes, then you can still do that through this link. Well, I mean, thank you so much for sharing. Like what really struck me was, it seems like there's a lot of impact in this. It seems like you really care about the hawkers and, you know, helping them get more money, um, get more revenue with no cost. And then, you know, with all this COVID thing as well, it seems like the company has a lot of, I would say, a threat of social impact in there, which is really nice to see. Uh, it kind of shows that, you know, um, even as we start startups, we can also think about how we can impact society and, 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 make, and bring value to it. Uh, thank you so much. I think everybody is wishing you um, thanks for sharing your story today. Uh, this whole session has been recorded and we would love to share it online as well. Um, if you have any other questions for Rishab or if you want to be connected to him, please let us know uh, and, and we will do a double bind and see if he's interested to talk to you as well. But anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. And thank you, especially for Rishab. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, and uh, as an SM alumni as well, I'm really happy to be connected with you. So please go give the meal, download his app, um, put in a discount code, join our incubation program, um, all kinds of things you can do after today. And have a really lovely Wednesday evening and enjoy um, Friday. It's a public holiday. Thank you so much, everyone. And we should, if you can stay a bit after this, that'd be great. I'd love to connect you with someone. Bye, sure, everyone. thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Applause.